celebrating 10 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Pastor Clarence Sexton. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. We're celebrating 10 years of possibility. And as you know, these are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible. It's my pleasure to have on the broadcast Pastor Clarence Sexton of Temple Baptist. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, Helen. I'm delighted to be here. I want to start with now and work backwards. Would you describe for me Temple Baptist Church <laughs> and Crown College? Uh, we believe in the Temple Baptist Church that we're there to, to embrace the community with the love of Christ. I've been there about a quarter of a century. We were in New York City, um, 11 miles from New York City in Patterson, New Jersey for eight years before coming there. Uh, this is my home area. Maryville's the place where I grew up. But uh, we, we'd like to think that we love the Lord, love people, and that our whole desire is to embrace the things of God's Word and to share those things with people. We think the real measure of a church is not its size, but its likeness to the Lord. And so we, we want to do what pleases Him. Right. And so the Temple Baptist Church is actively involved and everything from helping kids in school to learn to read, uh, tutoring kids in special areas of their of their uh, schoolwork, to um, of course the evangelistic ministries and gospel ministries. We have a hundred and nearly 150 different Bible studies that go on during the week. Wow. We're in 32 nursing homes, 27 high schools and middle schools, just trying to make an impact on people with the Word of God and being out where the need is and giving people an entry point that's outside the four walls of that church building. Um, so I know it's not about size, but how many members do you have at Temple Baptist? About 6,000 members. 6,000 members. And then Crown College, you have a college there. Yes. God put on your heart to start a right. college? Yes. Well, in 1978, God put on my heart to start a college, and I prayed and worked with that for years. Thirteen years later, we started Crown College, went to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission and did everything we we're supposed to do with them to be able to start a legitimate college to offer associate degrees and bachelor's degrees and now with a seminary, uh, graduate degrees. And um, we wanted to train people to serve the Lord. And as a matter of fact, we took a unique approach to this because what we're trying to do is to provide a biblical foundation for all the studies and the school, school of ministry, uh, school of education, then there's a school of business and trades, and the trades part of it, we're opening this fall, really excited about that. And then um, we have an international language navigator school where we're teaching people to speak English as a second language and other language studies so that we can navigate uh, through this world uh, with the language and doing it properly. So we're really excited about what God is doing in that school. We've, we've had um, more than 2,000 graduates. Our graduates are in every state and on every continent, serving the Lord and in business and everything imaginable, but most of them in ministry. I think when I, when I first met you, I was, I was really impressed with the man and the ministry, but I didn't know anything about your story. And based on where you are and what God has accomplished through your life and ministry and the people who co-labor with you, because I do I am sensitive to the fact that you understand that it's people. Oh, it is people. Yes. I thought the narrative would probably work something like this. Preacher's son grows up in the church. His father was a dynamic minister, leaves big church to son. Son wears better suits than his <laughs> father did. <laughs> he comes up with some novel you know, new marketing ideas to expand the family business, which is ministry, um, go to fade to black. I mean, yeah. And then when we sat down and you told me about your story, I was like, I was shocked. I, I, I really was looking for silver spoons and your life has been nothing, nothing but that. Where, where are you from and how does your story start? Yeah. Well, I, I want to tell you that I strongly believe in the goodness of God. It's Men have to work at it, but it's not what men can do. It's what God can do through them. But if you'd have found us as children, you know, my mother, brother, two sisters, my father, as long as he was there, 
uh, you'd have thought, not, not much hope for this crowd. Uh, I was born in Selma, Alabama. We moved all over the country. My father was a professional gambler. He didn't do this as a hobby. He did this as a living. Finally, his health faded, and he had to get into old beer joints and that type of thing, you know. Uh, we lived in 19 different places before I was in the third grade. Finally moved to Maryville, Tennessee. I'd gone to school six weeks in two schools in the first grade. I remember the day we started in the second grade. We really hadn't finished the first grade, but rolled around time to go to the second grade. And my, my dad said to my brother and to myself, we were, we were going to school. And he said, I can't take you this year because no one can find our address. Can't give it to anybody. And we stayed out all year. He said, just enjoy the year. We never went to school one day that year. Finally moved to the town of Maryville, Tennessee. My mother said, this has got to stop. These kids got to go to school. So we went to enroll in Sam Houston School in Maryville and as a third grader. I remember my mother being asked by the principal, Mr. Howard, um, what grade are they in? And my mother said, third. <laughs> we both looked at her like, how are we going to do this? And I had an amazing teacher named Miss Burns, tall lady, red hair, never married, that God used in a big way in my life. I, just you telling me this part of the story again, it's just dawning on me. If you only went six weeks in the first grade, none in the second grade, you launch in the third grade, there's no way you're ready for this. <laughs> no, I don't think we're ready for it, but God puts people in your life. That's why we're in the ministry, I think, you know. I know God's called me, but we want to help people uh, to become what God intended for them to become. So what did Miss Bird, you said her Miss name? Miss Burns. Burns. Yes. What did Miss Burns With that flaming Burns. red hair, can't you just see the kids, you know, Miss yeah. Burns? Well, Miss Burns loved me. She encouraged me. Somehow she found out about our home life, and she worked very hard at making me feel accepted, helping with other kids. And so I, I finished there. Other things are whirling around in my home while that's going on. We did was, stay in Maryland. What was happening in your home? My mother and father were getting a divorce and um, finally decided they couldn't live together. And um, shortly after that, he died. My mother raised four kids basically by herself. How'd she get money? She worked as a waitress and had no education. She had left home as an 11-year-old child. My father never had a chance either, you know. His father was killed in an accident when he was 10, and mother disappeared. Uh, he was past 40 when he met my mother. She was 17. They married. I was the first of four he was children. was 40, 40. She was 17. Right. And um, she would tell me her story, you know, from time to time. And then uh, two years after they were married, I was born, and so story begins. You know, it doesn't end there, thank God. <laughs> Let's take a pause right there. My guest is Dr. Clarence Sexton. We'll hear more of his story in just a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. And God was just lining up all these people. You know, where things were failing at home, God was lining up all these people to do something special for me, to give me an opportunity. Welcome back to Anything is Possible, today's story of possibility, Dr. Clarence Sexton. We went to breakfast, um, <laughs> and when the waitress was serving us at the very end, you were just very generous and kind with her, and you said, my mother was a waitress. Right. And there was a <laughs> connection there that it was almost emotional for you. Let's pick up your story there. Well, to tell you, said, you the story, my mother was four feet, 11 inches tall, and Weighed about 100 pounds, had no formal education, had to leave home when she was 11 because of an abusive stepfather. And uh, my mother earned a living to support four children by serving as a waitress. Every day when she'd finished the work, she'd come home at night and bring in her apron. You know, they'd wear an apron and she had a way of tying it up and all the tips were in the apron. And after my brother and two sisters were gone to bed, she'd put the apron out on the table, spread it all out, and I'd help her separate the money you know, dimes, nickels, quarters, whatever. And uh, we'd count it, and that's how we lived. And so I've always felt like when I was waited on by someone in a restaurant that I ought to be kind to them. Now, were you going to church? No. No, no. church? Well, you know, we maybe have been in and out of church. I, my mother took us to a doctor, a pediatrician in Maryville, Dr. Howard. He said, are they in Sunday school? She said, no, but they can go. She had to work. And um, I went to Sunday school there. And later, 
I went to the First Baptist Church in Maryville, and uh, the pastor there took an interest in me and the youth leader, and uh, that's where my story about Christianity begins, you know. The Lord, the Lord used that. But my mother cared about us, wanted us to do the right thing. She was meticulous, even laying out clothes for us. She'd say to me, now what goes with what, you know? She wanted us to be what she never had the opportunity to be. And God was always bringing people into my life, coaches, school what teachers. Did you, what did you want to be, though? I guess I basically early on wanted to be what my mother wanted me to be. She, she said to me, I guess, a hundred times without exaggeration, God has something special for your life. And I, I think she was doing that to encourage me because, you know, we thought we were having a hard time. We were happy. I mean, you know, honestly, I was happy. Kids, kids learn to be resilient. And, uh, but I, I knew from what she said, she really meant that, that God had something for my life. And I, I know the Lord's work that way. So take me from, this humble beginning <laughs> to being called to ministry because is, is that where you originally started or did God pull you that way? Well, I know I didn't originally start there. I lived across the street from Maryville High School. So I was all the time over at the high school, all the time, you know, around athletic things. Oddly enough, when I became a freshman in high school, I decided I want to go to Everett High School, which is the high school in the county high school. I don't know why. I mean, if you ask me this day, I don't know why, but God knew. Because my mother and I walked from 114 South Houston Street all the way through Maryville to Everett High School. We walked in the office, and uh, the principal was named Mr. Robert Davis. He looked at my little mother and looked at me, and he said, uh, do you have the responsibility of raising these children by yourself? Now, I thought that was such a kind way right. to say to them, have you been divorced or what? No, no. Do you have the responsibility of raising these children by yourself? She said, yes. And he said, I'm going to help you. And he's really the man God used in my life to turn my whole life around. How so? He just loved me. <laughs> Encouraged me. Uh, he just went to be the Lord this past, this past year. His son, Bobby, was the Republican chairman for the state of uh, Tennessee for quite a long time. He was the county mayor after he left his career in, in the high school. But he took an interest in me. If I could tell you one story, um, he helped me counseling me, coaching me along, mentoring me. One day in my sophomore year, he said, I want you to wear a shirt and tie tomorrow at school. I said, sure. He said, I'm going to take you to lunch. And so we, we got to lunchtime, and he walked me to his car, and we drove off the campus, went into Alcoa to a certain building where the Park Oil Company was giving awards. I didn't know anything about it, but I saw other adults with school-aged young people going in. When we got inside this room, we all sat around and from Porter High School, Friendsville High School, Maryville High School, uh, Wallen High School, Townsend High School, the principals were there with a the student. Well, I soon learned they were giving awards to those students. And I was taken there that day to get the award for the most improved student at Everett High School. And they gave me a little plaque, Park Oil Company Award. You know, Helen, how, how, I said... Uh, I graduated from Hiawassee College, University of Tennessee, went on to seminary and finished a doctor of ministry's degree. But I don't have anything hanging in my office but that one little plaque that said most improved student at Everett High School. That was the turning point in my life. And it turned you because? Because I knew that someone had opened a door for me of opportunity. And God met me in that door. I had, uh, had become a Christian. Dr. J. William Harbin at First Baptist Church in Maryville and Don Brakebill had personally talked to me about how to know the Lord as my Savior and I'd invited Jesus Christ in my life. And God was just lining up all these people, you know, where things were failing at home. God was lining up all these people uh, to do something special for me, to give me an opportunity. And uh, that's why I want to do everything I can to open those doors for other people. An amazing story because, and that's why I started at the end of your story, because <laughs> if you have a kid, the, those formative years in a child's life, that's where you lay a foundation yes. and you're being ripped up from city to city, place to place. I can't imagine what you were seeing at home. If well, my mother had two nervous breakdowns while all that was going on. One, we were left alone with her in the, in the home, little apartment. All we had was a little, I hate to say, make my story sound like something terrible, because it wasn't. I mean, God was with us, and people came along and helped us and encouraged us, but all we had was a little hot plate to cook on. And I still remember, we had a skillet, we'd melt butter in the skillet, we'd fry bread, we'd fry eggs, we'd feed our mother, take care of her, the neighbors would try to help, but it was our responsibility. 
But Howard and I wouldn't take anything from those things. That was God's unconscious preparation in my life. And I wouldn't feel the way I do today about knowing that God can help people. It's not what you see. It's what God can do with what you see. And um, that's where the possibility is. Let's take a quick break. Uh, my guest is Pastor Clarence Sexton of Crown College and Temple Baptist, a real story of possibility. We'll have more in just a moment. Coming up. I think the, the, the most defining thing about a Christian is hopefulness, that we're hopeful. I mean, it's not wishful thinking. That's what Jesus Christ does for you. He makes you a hopeful person. Dr. Clarence Sexton is my guest on Anything is Possible. Yours is a, an incredible story of possibility. Um, just the way you process this, um, there is a, a relentless optimism about you. Um, you told us about the turning point in your life, about somebody recognizing you as most improved. And it's really powerful what happens to people when a person of significance and significance I define by somebody, so, someone that you look at, that if they give you their brand of yes. affirmation, it's the kind of affirmation you need to believe it yourself. I think the, the, the most defining thing about a Christian is hopefulness, that we're hopeful. I mean, it's not wishful thinking. That's what Jesus Christ does for you. He makes you a hopeful person. And uh, I can't go through life pessimistic. I got a lot of responsibility and a lot of people who count on me, but I believe God can. And you fill in the blank, you know, God can. And uh, I want to try to do all I can to reach children. We got a group of boys called Brave Boys and Girls. And the girls, brave girls, brave boys. Somebody said, why do you call them brave boys and girls? Because they have to stand up and do the right thing. They have to say yes. Yes to their creator God. Yes to authority in the home. Yes, in schoolwork, that type of thing. And you had to have courage today to live that kind of life. And uh, all of that came out of my childhood. And my story, I think, is a story of unconscious preparation. Right. We're not really aware of what's happening at the moment as God works, but He's working. And the composite of that is supposed to be something that brings glory to Him. And that's what I, that's what I, I believe so, in. So, so do you believe that God calibrated your sensitivity to other people's pain by allowing you to experience pain? I don't feel badly about anything that happened to me. I, I really don't. And I think that I can care. I'd hate to think people had to go through all these things, you know, to be able to care because I certainly don't think that's true. But I do that. I think God gave me perspective. Let's just say God gave me perspective. I, I see a broader picture. Let me ask you about the way you walk. <laughs> I notice you walk with a little bit of a, a hitch in your giddy up, as they say. <laughs> yeah. I'm what not trying to pretend to be like John Wayne either. <laughs> I've had, I, I've had uh, four reconstructive spine surgeries. The last one was my neck. And um, I sort of forget about that. Evelyn's always saying to me, my wonderful wife of 45 years, and she's a doll, let me tell you. She's saying, stand up straight, honey. Try a little harder. Put your heel down first. And I'm working at it. Um, but it's just something God gave me, you know. I mean, I have uh, spinal stenosis and scoliosis and all that kind of stuff. And What'd they have to do to your spine? Uh, they had to go inside with a hammer and chisel and clean it out. <laughs> and I went to a spine institute to have that happen. But I'm, I'm alive, you know, and I'm working and Are you happy. supposed to be walking? Mm, the first doctor told me I wouldn't, but I've been, I've been walking. Yeah, doing good. Very good. <laughs> Tell me about your children. I have two grown sons. Uh, one of them has just started a, a new church in in uh, Seymour, Tennessee, doing a great job. The other one is a, a chief executive officer at, our, uh, officer at our college and does a great job. They have beautiful wives, and I got six grandchildren, and uh, I'm, I'm happy, happy with the wonderful, beautiful wife God's given me, and happy with those boys. And we've gone through our struggles as parents and all those kinds of things, but God's been with us. We're very happy about it. The name of this show is Anything is Possible. Uh, great stories about great people. You put God in the mix and I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> before, before you get away, would you just take a minute to teach us about what you've learned about possibility? I, I think you do a great job. 
I, I, I told you when we were out to eat, I noticed, I noticed when the first man I ever went out to eat with <laughs> at the Cracker Barrel, I've been there many, many times, who took the folded napkin and the silverware, unfolded the napkin, laid it properly on the table, and put the right pieces on it. And I thought immediately, somebody's mother did a great job. And that's, that spoke to me because I'm saying as early as possible, as deliberately as possible, as specifically as possible, and as hopeful as possible, let's get the right things into young people. And uh, I think the greatest thing we need is to get an emphasis on the home and children. We can't clean up America unless we do something about young people and children. And it has to be specific and hopeful. Look at look at uh, Ben Carson. Yeah. Yeah. He he he's the first doctor to successfully separate Siamese twins at the head. Look at his life. Okay, his mother couldn't from. read or write. Right. Somebody put something in, and he prays before every surgery. I'm looking for a Ben Johnson uh, Carson out there, aren't you? Yeah. And everyone I can help. And I think somebody somebody did that for me, and I'm in debt. In let me ask you. Let me ask you one other question, because this is something I've noticed about possibility people, or what I like to call possibility engineers. So, what happened with your spine, and what happened in your upbringing? Those are both really difficult things. And as we touched on both of them, here's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we went right on past them. There was no, there was no stopping. Let's get out. Let me give you yeah. a tour of, of my brokenness at all. You, you blew yeah. past both of them. I think those are things that make us. They don't break us. Those are God's ingredients. Just like when your mother made a cake, she put great ingredients in it. You love the taste of it. These are the things that an all-wise God chose for me. And I'm, I'm not going to be upset about what God's allowed in my life and where God took me and what God did with me because these are the ingredients God chose for my life. And I'm happy. I'm happy in Him. That, that's awesome. I guess that's proof anything. <laughs> is possible. Dr. Sexton, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank We're you. real fans of yours, and my wife is your biggest fan in town. God bless you. She loves listening to you. The fork goes here, the knife goes <laughs> That's here, right. the spoon goes here. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>